The information in this video might be more important than anything that I have ever told you. In every one of my videos, I tell you things that hinge on one of the landmark ideas in financial economics, the efficiency of the capital markets. As fundamental as market efficiency is to good financial decision making, it is poorly understood by most investors. I have been telling you information that is based on this foundational principle of finance, but I've never taken the time to explain to you why it is so important. Condensing the foundations of modern financial theory into a short video is ambitious, but I'm going to do my best. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to tell you why the efficient market hypothesis matters to your investment decisions. Financial theory starts with asset pricing. How do investors decide how much to pay for a stock? Theoretically, rational investors are willing to pay a price for a stock based on the present value of expected future earnings. All else equal, investors will pay more for higher expected earnings, and they will pay less for riskier future earnings. Whether or not investors are rationally evaluating investments this way brings us to the concept of market efficiency. As defined by Eugene Fama in 1970, a market in which prices always fully reflect available information is called efficient. This is a simple sounding concept, but it is also extremely important and terribly misunderstood. Informational efficiency in a market stems from competition for profits, low transaction costs, and readily available information. If there is information suggesting that an asset's value will be higher in the future, competitive traders with low cost access to the market will buy that asset today, increasing its price. The competition to incorporate new information into prices for profit means that prices should change quickly as new information develops. New information is random, and therefore price changes should be random. This point is at the core of index investing. If price changes are based on new information, and therefore not predictable, then trying to predict them, as any traditional active manager or stock picker does, should not be expected to improve your outcome. And that's before the higher costs and risks of active management are considered. In an efficient market, low-cost index investing makes sense. Explaining why market efficiency matters is easy to do. I just did it in one sentence. Explaining how we know that efficient markets reflect reality is a much bigger task, but it is a task worth undertaking. To continue this discussion, I need to make sure that we all have the same baseline understanding of a few concepts, starting with the meaning of the words empirical and theoretical. Empirical research means looking at real data. For example, noticing that day-to-day -day changes in stock prices are random is an empirical observation. Empirical observations are concrete, but drawing insight from empirical observations is more abstract. This is where we see the importance of theory. Theory is an idea about why things work the way that they do. In financial economics, empirical research and theory are tied together by scientific method, forming a hypothesis, collecting data, and testing the hypothesis. If economists make consistent empirical observations about stock returns, they might develop a hypothesis about what is driving that empirical result. Once a hypothesis has been created, it can be tested in the data. If a theory ends up doing a good job of explaining reality, it becomes a useful decision tool. In 1900, 70 years before Fama published his landmark work on market efficiency, Louis Bacalier, a French statistician, noticed that stock prices seemed to follow a random walk. In the 1950s and 1960s, more empirical work emerged, suggesting that stock prices move randomly. With no theoretical explanation for this randomness, economists at the time concluded that stock prices did not have any economic meaning. In 1965, Paul Samuelson brought forward the idea that in a well-functioning and competitive market, we would expect prices to change as investors' expectations adapt to new information. This theoretical explanation, called the fair game model, started to bring meaning to the randomness of stock prices. The work of Samuelson was followed by Fama's now famous 1970 paper, Efficient Capital Markets, a Review of Theory and Empirical Work. A simple summary of past work is not what made Fama's paper famous. Fama formalized an empirical approach to testing the theory of market efficiency. Fama never claimed that the market is perfectly efficient. Perfect efficiency is an ideal state that real markets can only approach. That is not a shortcoming of the efficient market hypothesis. Theory is not meant to be reality. The map is not the territory. Theory allows us to predict what the world might look like in an ideal state and compare that prediction to reality. 
In the case of efficient markets, reality does look very similar to what we would predict an efficient market to look like. Market efficiency predicts that prices should move randomly, active managers should not be successful at beating the market, and prices should change quickly based on new information. Each of these predictions describe real markets. Stock price changes are random. Active managers do, on average, trail the market after costs. Even managers with the best returns are no more likely to have strong future returns. Event studies, that is, observing ex post how prices moved based on new information, have indicated that markets are generally very quick to incorporate new information. One of the challenges with the efficient market hypothesis is that it cannot be definitively proved or disproved. This was acknowledged by Fama as the joint hypothesis theorem. Any attempt to test market efficiency is really a test of two distinct hypotheses. It is jointly a test of the efficient market hypothesis and a test of the model of market equilibrium. What I just said will make sense in a second. Stick with me. The model of market equilibrium is the model of how the market prices assets. We can think about value stocks as an example. Under the capital asset pricing model, that is defining risk as only the risk of the market, value stocks produce higher average returns than would be expected based on their riskiness. Under the capital asset pricing model for equilibrium pricing, value stocks violate the efficient market hypothesis. They create a systematic excess return that cannot be explained by risk. This result could mean one of two things. Markets are not efficient, or the model being used for market equilibrium is flawed. The implication of the joint hypothesis theorem is that the concept of market efficiency is only as empirically useful as the model that we have for market equilibrium. Specifying this equilibrium model has been the grounds for much of the work in empirical finance since 1970. In the case of value stocks, later research revealed that the single factor capital asset pricing model for market equilibrium was not accounting for the independent risk of value stocks. Adding the independent risk of value stocks to the model takes away the efficient market violation. Value stocks do not violate market efficiency, they are just riskier than we originally understood. Improving the equilibrium model for asset pricing by identifying independent risks led to the Fama French three-factor model in 1992, which includes the independent risks of the market, small stocks, and value stocks, and the five-factor model in 2014, adding the independent risks of stocks with robust profitability and stocks that invest aggressively to the three-factor model. Without the efficient market hypothesis, empirical finance would just be a collection of anecdotes. Efficient markets as a framework has allowed financial economists to evaluate theories by their rejectable predictions, as opposed to observing the individual outcomes of successful investors. We now have the ability to gain insight into how markets work, as opposed to relying on anecdotes that we hope to replicate. An anecdote is like a story. One sample of a successful outcome with no theoretical explanation and no empirical corroboration. In a social science like economics, we want to build an understanding of the world that allows us to make better decisions, while avoiding the type of bias that anecdotes often promote. Warren Buffett or anyone else being successful picking stocks is an anecdote, but asking why he was successful is not a productive question. It might be similar to asking a doctor why your grandpa lived to be 98 even though he smoked a pack of cigarettes a day. Science does not have the explanation for every outcome, but this does not make it a good idea to start smoking or stock picking. Interestingly, Buffett's performance has now been explained within the framework of an efficient market. He simply knew which types of risks to maintain exposure to, and used extreme discipline and leverage to do so. Again, we see the joint hypothesis problem. Buffett is not proof of market inefficiency when the appropriate model for equilibrium pricing is specified. As the model for market equilibrium pricing has developed over time, it has gotten increasingly difficult to find violations of the efficient market hypothesis. With the Fama French five-factor model, the vast majority of differences in returns between two diversified portfolios can be explained by differences in exposure to the independent risks identified in the model. Adding more factors to a model to make it explain returns sounds like overfitting or data mining. But the way that this model was developed is another critical aspect of modern financial theory. In their 2006 paper, Profitability, Investment, and Average Returns, Fama and French documented the body of empirical work showing that three specific common characteristics of stocks predict higher average returns. Price relative to book value, where cheaper stocks have higher average returns. Profitability, where all else equal, a more profitable stock must have a higher expected return. And investment, 
where all else equal, a stock that reinvests profits conservatively must have a higher expected return. They took these individual empirical observations and used the framework of valuation theory to construct a new set of empirical tests. Valuation theory predicts that there should be a relationship between these three characteristics. Past empirical work had observed them individually. Based on the theory, properly observing the effects of each characteristic must be done by controlling for the other two. Fama and French verified this empirically in 2006, which eventually led to the five-factor model, the most complete model of market equilibrium to date. This takes us to 2014, which is when the Fama French paper introducing the five-factor model came out. We're not talking about ancient history here. Remember, equilibrium pricing is the theoretical model for how the market prices assets. The five-factor model suggests that the market prices more risk into certain types of assets as identified in the five-factor model. The five-factor model can be used to empirically test the concept of market efficiency, subject, of course, to the joint hypothesis problem that we talked about earlier. In its current form, the five-factor model is able to explain over 90% of the difference in returns between any two diversified portfolios. The room for arguments about market inefficiency has gotten very small. Any return difference that appears to be an anomaly, like the returns of dividend-paying stocks, for example, can most likely be explained by exposure to the risk factors identified in the model. Understanding that this was not an exercise in blind data mining is important. It comes from making empirical observations, developing logical hypotheses, and testing the hypotheses. Today, the theory of efficient markets and equilibrium pricing is robust enough that in empirical testing, it explains almost any difference in returns over any historical time period in any country that we have data for. It is also able to explain anomalies like low beta stocks, and even the performance of Warren Buffett. What used to seem like proof that the market was not efficient has today been explained by how assets are priced in an efficient market. Asset pricing is extremely important to how investors allocate their capital. The price that you pay for a stock defines your expected return. If prices are constantly wrong, investors will not know where to allocate capital. Fortunately, there is a strong theoretical and empirical case that markets are efficient. They price stocks based on their expected future earnings and the riskiness of those earnings. Market efficiency has sweeping implications on how you should invest your money. At a bare minimum, market efficiency should push investors toward low-cost index funds. There is no way to exploit random stock price changes to generate higher average returns, so taking what the market has to offer is a smart bet. At a more advanced level, there is a strong theoretical and empirical case that the five-factor asset pricing model is a good model of market equilibrium. Based on this, allocating more capital to the types of stocks that the model predicts to have higher expected returns could be sensible. Finally, I think it is worth mentioning the role of evidence in decision-making. The medical field has a hierarchy of evidence, ranking types of evidence based on their quality and their risk of bias. The lowest form of evidence in this hierarchy is expert opinion while well, the highest is systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials. In the world of financial economics, we do not have randomized controlled trials, but we do have a nearly unlimited pool of data for empirical testing. There is a scientific approach to accessing the capital markets efficiently. Despite this, investors will be quick to listen to the words of a successful hedge fund manager or the CEO of a big bank, while being quick to dismiss the theory and evidence that we have discussed today. As I mentioned earlier, the map is not the territory. The models are not perfect reflections of reality. But we have a choice between making decisions based on the theory and empirical data, or making decisions based on what we hope will do well, even if that hope is at odds with the data. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital, and this is Common Sense Investing. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. Don't forget, if you've run out of common sense investing videos to watch, you can tune in to weekly episodes of the Rational Reminder podcast wherever you get your podcasts.